Well, good day, everybody. This is uh, Chris, the Ancient Scholar, and it's been a little while since I've had a video up, so I want to go ahead and throw a video up, and this is kind of one of those just pondering uh, questions, if you've ever asked it or wondered it, and this goes back uh, to uh, respiratory, more respiratory, um, respiratory physiology. And the question that I'm, I'm asking today is, why does the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve have the shape that it has? And if you're not familiar with that, let's just go ahead and um, draw it. So if I, if I were to make a graph here, and I have my y-axis, and then I have my x-axis here. And on the y-axis going up is my S A little a O2. Okay, that's my saturation of arterial oxygen. So that's the percentage of hemoglobin that is bound with oxygen, or the percentage of hemoglobin that has, has oxygen bound to it. And then here on the right is the um, oxygen tension, the partial pressure uh, of oxygen, the P little a O2, uh, the PaO2. And if I plot that, um, Okay, so I plot the SaO2 as a function of the PaO2. Um, I get what's called a, a sigmoid curve, and it's kind of an S-shaped curve, and it looks a little, oops, a little like, um, like this. It starts off really low, goes up really high quickly, and then asymptotes, um, and then kind of asymptotes off. Um, and that's what the normal curve looks like and this is kind of a curious kind of a curious thing um, I, I think up here okay as, as it asymptotes off I, I think this this makes some sense here um, because once all of the hemoglobin in my body so once all the hemoglobin in my body is pretty much saturated um, it doesn't matter how much higher the the pressure of oxygen happens to be in my arteries I'm not going to load any more oxygen on the hemoglobin it doesn't matter how high the pressure gets so this this kind of makes sense here but but what what maybe isn't initially intuitive is what's going on down here um why are why is this the, you have this little area here this little part here where it 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 doesn't, it kind of seems like, well, you know, the, there, there's more oxygen and maybe a little bit of hemoglobin has oxygen, but it, it's not really loading oxygen on very well down here. And then at some point, all of a sudden, it just shoots up and all the hemoglobin loads oxygen really quickly until the hemoglobin is, is fully loaded, if, if you will. Um, so why why this down here? Why is why is this little 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 part of it that just isn't going up? You know, I I would expect it if you know, maybe uh, I'll draw it in a different color. I, I might even expect um, something like uh, like this oh, like this. I would expect a curve like that, like that blue curve where it you know. Uh, there was a you know incredibly rapid rate of onloading and then it asymptoted off um, so the, the 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 rate of change is 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 pretty constant pretty high until all the hemoglobin um, is fully loaded with uh, with oxygen but that's not what we see we see this s-shaped curve there's something really interesting going on here um, and what's going on let me just clear that is actually kind of interesting. So if you if you look at the hemoglobin molecule, because it's, it's actually that's the protein that, that binds oxygen. Hemoglobin um, is is composed of four different um, what we could call subunits, and and these these subunits are called uh, globin chains, and there are four of them, and, and you have two um, what we call alpha. Um, so you have two alpha. Um, Globul globin chains, okay, and then you have two beta chains, like so. This is obvious not to scale. And then um, what you have in, in, the, in the middle here, let me maybe draw 
uh, that in a different color. In, in the middle of these um, alpha and beta chains, you have iron. Okay, and you have iron here. Each one of these has a has an iron, and that iron is able to complex. Okay, it's able to complex with um, oxygen. Okay, and it, so a, a each molecule, one molecule of hemoglobin is able to complex four molecules of of, of oxygen. Um, and, and this is kind of the interesting thing. Uh, Deoxygenated hemoglobin, okay. Uh, Deoxygenated hemoglobin is kind of interesting um, when we compare and contrast it to oxygenated hemoglobin. So, uh, the when we look at deoxygenated hemoglobin, um, because hemoglobin is a protein, um, and proteins have a very special shape called the conformation. Um, Hemoglobin has a very special shape when it's deoxygenated. So deoxygenated or deoxy hemoglobin. Okay. Hemoglobin that doesn't have oxygen attached to it, <clears throat> excuse me, deoxy hemoglobin um, has a very special conformation. We actually call that. Um, conformation the T okay it is known as the T conformation C O N F all right the T conformation and the T stands for tense and in this conformation believe it or not deoxy <clears throat> hemoglobin is not per does not have a very high affinity for oxygen it is what we call right shifted and if that doesn't mean anything to you go ahead and take a look at some of my other videos that I've done on the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve um, so deoxygenated hemoglobin is right shifted it has a low a low affinity a low affinity for oxygen it doesn't particularly want to bind to oxygen but here's the really cool thing. Here's a really cool thing. Once binding occurs, okay, so once you have one, and eventually it's going to happen, you know, because you have deoxygenated hemoglobin going through the capillaries in the lungs, you have lots of oxygen. Eventually, an oxygen is going to bind even if that hemoglobin has low affinity. But once the oxygen binds, okay, once binding, just one molecule of oxygen, Okay, once that occurs, there is a conformational change that occurs um, with the hemoglobin, and it um, then transitions into what's called the R conformation. And the R stands for relaxed. And once that conformational change happens, the hemoglobin instantly becomes um, its affinity it, it changes drastically and it shifts more leftward it has an increased affinity okay it has an increased affinity for oxygen in fact just um, just the, the, the initial trans, trans, uh, transition from the uh, the tense conformation to the relaxed conformation results in about a 500 um, fold okay it be, the hemoglobin becomes 500 times more um, likely or its its um, affinity for oxygen increases 500 times and so then what happens is once you have one molecule of oxygen bind this conformational change occurs and then oxygen readily is loaded on to the hemoglobin and we see that in the normal oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve we see that down here down here let's uh, change the color um, it starts off low okay and then once you start having 
you know, a molecule, once you, once the hemoglobin starts transitioning from the uh, T, the tense, to the relaxed conformation, um, then the hemoglobin readily picks up oxygen, and you see that, that um, characterized by this very steep slope here, okay, so once that, once that initial conformational change occurs in all the hemoglobin, it readily loads oxygen on until it's pretty much full, um, of oxygen. So hopefully that explains why we see this this initial area down here kind of low because initially the hemoglobin doesn't have a very high affinity for oxygen. It's only in, in, in it's only until you you get initial binding um, of oxygen occurring that the conformational change then causes the hemoglobin to want to load oxygen on very rapidly and effectively. Okay guys, hopefully you found this uh, video helpful. Um, or at least um, kind of kind of interesting. As always, thanks for hanging in there.